Um, our next speaker is um, Georgina Oliver and Georgina is a research assistant at the University of Melbourne and she's going to share some results with us and details coming up with the research they've been doing around the NAC for OCD and other nutrient based um, compounds. Please uh, welcome Georgina Oliver. Thank you. Today. It's really nice to be here presenting. Um, so I'm a research assistant at the University of Melbourne and I work across a few different research studies in mental health. So mainly looking at nutrient type interventions that we can use alongside people's current medication to see if we can get an even greater benefit as well as looking at some lifestyle medicine strategies, which I think Jerome is going to talk to you about shortly. Um, but I guess I'll always have quite a big spot in my heart for OCD research because it was my first introduction into the field. I actually worked on an OCD clinical trial for my master's research, which I finished last year. Um, that's the n acetylcysteine study that Scott mentioned. So I do have some results I can share with you about that research study today. But I also wanted to talk about another area that I find particularly fascinating um, across psychiatry in general, but particularly OCD, and that is the area of, of inflammation. So we've seen abnormal levels of inflammation in all different sorts of medical disorders, but um, more and more so in various psychiatric disorders. Um, so I thought I could take you through some of the research studies that have looked at that in OCD specifically, but I do just want to warn you that it's not very clear cut. I won't be able to give you much closure about this area. Um, some studies sort of conflict with one another, we often get results that we don't initially expect um, in these research studies. But I still find it quite interesting nonetheless because it starts to give us a bit of an, another idea that we can think about in terms of um, our treatment for psychiatric disorders. Um, so one of the ways we can measure inflammation in the body is by measuring um, levels of cytokines in the bloodstream. So cytokines are a, a group of cells, um, they're sort of a big family of a particular type of cells, and they're primarily involved with coordinating the inflammatory response in the body, which is something that's really important. We all need our body to, I guess, produce inflammation. It's our body's uh, way of fighting an infection or uh, repairing, say, a, a, a tissue injury. So we all need our body to do this. It's just that more and more in chronic disease, we're starting to see this process become quite abnormal. So really broadly speaking, cytokines can either be pro-inflammatory, which is where they will initiate or they'll sustain an inflammatory response or they can be anti-inflammatory, where they um, sort of squash or, or balance inflammation in the body. And not only do cytokines have a role in this inflammatory response, but they're also involved with the development and the function of the central nervous system, so including having an influence on certain um, neurochemicals in the brain, so things like serotonin and glutamate, Scott's already mentioned. Uh, and also a role in um, hormone uh, activity. So things like cortisol, which is one of our stress hormones, something that the body releases um, to try and fight and, and cope with stress. So cytokines will actually also have a role in, in the way this cortisol is released and how it then goes um, to operate in the body. So they, they do have quite a 
of a wide range of actions in the body. Um, so two researchers, um, they published a, re a review paper in 2012. These guys do quite a lot of research in OCD specifically. And they looked at all the different studies that had been um, published up to that point that assessed um, the blood levels of cytokines in, in people with OCD in comparison to people without OCD, so what we say is our healthy controls. Um, and what they found in those studies, they came across 12 um, in total, and um, in four of those 12 studies, they looked at um, pro a pro-inflammatory cytokine called interleukin-1 beta. So that's a particular part of that cytokine family. And that particular cytokine has a role in um, when our body has a fever, so that immune system trying to fight off an infection through a fever. This particular cytokine is involved quite closely in that. Um, but across those four studies, which had about 77 people with OCD collectively, all of those people were comorbidity free, so they didn't have any other diagnosable mental health disorder happening alongside the OCD, no depression, um, anything like that. And in three of the four studies, they were all um, unmedicated, so not taking medication at the time they had their blood tests taken. And this tends to be an ideal scenario when we start to try and look at what's happening in the OCD specifically. We try to remove sort of as many external influencing variables as possible. That gives us more of an idea about what the OCD is doing, even though that does tend to be unrealistic in sort of in the general sort of setting with OCD. It often does come with all these other comorbidities. But um, so what they actually found across those four studies that this pro-inflammatory cytokine was actually significantly lower in people who had OCD compared to the people without. So not off to a great start there, but we'll keep going. Um, interleukin-6 is another one of our pro-inflammatory cytokines. There were five <coughs> studies that looked at this particular inflammatory marker. Two of those studies involve just um, a, a paediatric population, so children with OCD, and all those children were on medication at the time they did have that blood test. And they found in those two studies that the interleukin-6 levels were significantly lower um, compared to those healthy controls, whereas in the adult studies, the interleukin-6 was much, much higher compared to healthy controls. So if we were just to look at the results from those studies, we could start to, um, I guess, guess that perhaps it's the medication which may have been decreasing levels of this interleukin, so having, I guess, an anti-inflammatory effect, um, or was it perhaps a person's age, so adults having high levels, maybe we see this interleukin-6 going up with time, but still not able to tell from the studies that were conducted in that area. Uh, and in another study related, they also looked at interleukin-6, but they looked at it in the cerebral spinal fluid. So not in blood, but where they take a, a puncture from, from the spine and they'll look at the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And they didn't actually find any significant difference um, between these interleukin-6 in, in that particular study. Uh, another one of our pro-inflammatory cytokines is called tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, we know this cytokine is influenced by um, things like a person's age, as well as their body weight, um, their gender, the time of day the blood test is taken, as well as any medication they might be taking. So this one, I guess, is a bit harder to, to work out what exactly it would be doing in the OCD itself. Uh, there were six studies that they found uh, where they looked at this um, inflammatory marker and they only found the tumor necrosis factor to be higher when there was comorbid depression happening alongside the OCD. In um, one particular study, they actually would provoke a person's obsessive compulsive symptoms and then take the blood test soon after. 
and actually found that this tumor necrosis factor went sort of significantly lower compared to people um, without OCD. Um, but interestingly, some of our genetic studies have actually start to find a trend for people with OCD, um, starting to see abnormalities within the genes that will sort of dictate what the tumor necrosis factor will actually go on to do in the body, which starts to give us some insight as to why we are seeing these abnormalities with the tumor necrosis factor to begin with. Um, this was a, another study that came out in 2012, which wasn't included in, in that review. And again, they looked at people with OCD against those without. Um, they didn't find any significant difference between tumor necrosis factor. But what they did find was that a particular receptor that the tumor necrosis factor has to actually um, bind to, we can sort of think as a receptor is what a, a cell would have to bind to to go on and have an effect in the body. So this particular receptor was actually um, significantly higher in a person's bloodstream with OCD than the healthy controls. And the researchers suggested that this was actually a better indicator of that sort of low grade inflammation rather than just looking at the tumor necrosis factor on its own which we know is, I guess, a lot more sort of sensitive to those other external variables I mentioned in that last slide. Um, and interestingly in that study as well, they started to see a bit of a pattern with certain symptom presentations of OCD. So people that had more sort of hoarding behaviours, um, there was a particular cytokine that correlated um, with hoarding, as well as that of sort of um, contamination, obsessions and compulsions. There was um, two particular cytokines that were correlated with that. So that sort of adds, adds more weight to that idea that perhaps um, given all the different ways that OCD can present, gives us more of an indication that there, there may be sort of individual aspects in the, in the way that the body is kind of producing these OCD symptoms. Um, and one last study that came out in 2000 and in India, um, 20 adults uh, with OCD against 20 without. Again, what we call, a, I guess, a cleaner sample in the sense that they weren't taking any medication. There were 16 in the 20 um, that had never been on medication at all. Um, and again, comorbidity free. And that particular study found that the, um, the people with OCD had higher levels of some of those inflammatory cytokines we've talked about, so the interleukin-6 and the tumor necrosis factor, another um, inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-4, but they also found higher levels of some of our anti-inflammatory cytokines, so um, things like interleukin-2 and interleukin-10, more of our anti-inflammatory ones. And so you could start to think, well, what's going on here? Why are we seeing higher levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines? But what the researchers thought might be happening there was that there was this sort of initial underlying inflammatory process happening, and then the body had to work even harder and harder and harder to try and make more anti-inflammatory cytokines to try and counteract that. So they weren't able to directly prove that um, in the way that they designed their study, but that was one of the one of the ideas um, that they did have about that. Um, so it's not all, it's not very clear cut, and like I said, we've got some studies that show one thing and, and others that show another. But what we can start to see from all those studies collectively is that there is something abnormal happening with those cytokines. So in comparison to our healthy controls, we know that there's something different happening in people with OCD which makes us start to think about where might this inflammation be coming from in the first place. So we know our genes are, I guess, very much the framework of what our cells can, can go on and do in the body. And like we saw with the tumor necrosis factor gene, there's probably all sorts of other abnormalities in genes um, that would dictate what other cytokines do. So that's um, one possibility about why we're seeing that. 
I mentioned before that um, cytokines have an influence on our um, central nervous system and various new neurotransmitters, but this is actually a, a bi-directional um, sort of relationship. So neurotransmitters can also go on to influence the activity of cytokines. And we've known for a really long time that um, there's abnormalities in the way that serotonin reacts in the brain, more recently how glutamate acts in the brain in people with, with OCD. So perhaps these cytokines are just sort of a, a byproduct of what those neurotransmitters are already doing. Um, Scott mentioned about the pan, pandas syndrome, so some case reports of people that will, will have an infection um, and go on to um, experience OCD, um, giving us a bit more of an idea about perhaps that this, there's this immune system involvement in the development or even contributing to the presentation of OCD. And even though that's still a, a controversial area, they are starting to do more and more research studies looking into that. And then lastly, stress. We know that when we're stressed, all these cytokines, um, they do become activated. And I've heard many, many people say that no, their symptoms always seem to get worse with stress. So that also makes sense. But at this stage, it's still, we're just still not sure what's causing what. It's still pretty unclear about why it's happening. All we know is that it is happening. So what do we do with that in information? Is this, is this something we look at treating? And in a way, we sort of already have been treating inflammation in OCD for quite a while, ever since they first brought in medication to treat the disorder, really, because our tricyclic antidepressants and our SSRIs, they, um, there's some research to suggest that they can actually have a, a balancing effect on cytokines. So we know that certain classes of SSRIs can actually um, decrease tumor necrosis factor, um, can decrease interleukin-6, and could also increase interleukin-10, so one of our anti-inflammatory cytokines. So perhaps it's, it's not only this effect that these medications have on, say, serotonin, but maybe they're also having an influence on that cytokine activity as well, which is why we are seeing benefits for people who do take these medications. Um, but some new research that's come out as well that's looked at other anti-inflammatory agents. Um, there's been two studies that have looked at this particular drug called Celecoxib or Celebrex, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, drug. And there were some studies in 2011 and 2015 um, where they used the Celebrex alongside an SSRI or just an SSRI on its own. And the, the people who were taking the, the combo, so the Celebrex with the SSRI, their symptoms got a lot, lot better in comparison to just the SSRI on its own. And they also got that improvement more quickly than the group just on the SSRI. So that's, that's pretty promising. Again, needs to be replicated in more studies, but that um, starts to give us a bit of an idea. And uh, the 2011 study, a lot of the people that were enrolled into that study, they, um, their OCD severity was, was pretty high. They had a, a really quite a high score on the Y box scale that they used to measure that severity. And it came down significantly. So I think it started off at about 35, sort of out of 40, 40 being the highest you can go, came down to about, say, 10 by the end of the 10-week period. So that was a really, really big effect that they did see. There you go. So that's that graph I was just talking about. So starting off at 35 on that Y box and coming right, right down, um, yeah, probably about, say, 13 or so. That's the Celebrex group on the bottom there. And then lastly, NAP. So this is what I mentioned before. This is what we looked at in the clinical trial that I worked on for my masters. And um, N-acetylcysteine is a, an amino acid um, type structure. And it has a few different, I guess, mechanisms about why we like the look of it for OCD. So one being that it um, balances the amount of glutamate that is released from cells in the brain. 
And there's quite a lot of, I guess, research studies building at the moment to show that certain people with OCD do have these abnormalities in glutamate. It also increases the um, synthesis of uh, glutathione. So one of, I guess, the most potent antioxidants that the body can make itself. Um, and glutathione is actually the, the key antioxidant that protects all the cells in the brain from, from inflammation and oxidative stress. And we know that NAC can actually increase glutathione levels in the brain. NAC also has some direct anti-inflammatory properties, so can uh, decrease tumor necrosis factor we've talked about, it can decrease interleukin 1 beta um, and interleukin 6, as well as some other inflammatory compounds as well. And this was a quite a recent study that's just come out early in the year, which, which gives us some, some further, I guess, support for NAC and the treatment of OCD. So this was the first neuroimaging study that actually assessed glutathione levels in the brain in a group of individuals with OCD. And they actually found that in one particular area of the brain, which we've known for, for quite a while tends to be quite hyperactive in people with OCD, that in this particular area, the glutathione levels were much, much lower compared to healthy controls. Um, the idea that they thought this might be happening is because of all this sort of hyperactivity, um, the brain can produce free radicals as a byproduct of this, which can go on to cause oxidative stress, which is exactly what glutathione tries to combat. So given that it is so hyperactive that it's almost like a burnout syndrome, there's just not enough glutathione to counteract. So another reason why we, we would sort of hope or expect that NAC may be beneficial for people with OCD. Um, so this is, <coughs> I guess, the study that I did work on. So. Um, we looked at using 3,000 milligrams of, of N-acetylcysteine or placebo alongside um, a person's current treatment for their OCD. It was quite a small study in the end. We had about 35 people we could analyse in that group. And we looked at the, the effects of NAP or placebo over a period of 16 weeks. And you can see that Y box there again. So that's sort of our main scale or questionnaire that we use to measure the severity and the impact of the OCD itself. Um, so ideally you want to see the scores come down with treatment. And unfortunately we didn't see much of a significant effect of NAC um, for reducing people's overall Y-box score when we sort of put the two groups, um, when we sort of averaged out their scores between the two groups we didn't see much of an effect across, across the study. Um, but what we did find was that NAC was, I guess, uh, more beneficial than placebo at um, helping reduce people's compulsive symptoms. So not so much the obsessive thoughts, but more so the compulsive behaviours. And that was evident by week 12, so after 12 weeks of taking the NAC. But unfortunately, this effect was lost come week 16. We were able to start to look at who in particular um, NAC may be more beneficial for in our group, and we did find that um, people with, say, more mild to moderate presentations of OCD rather than, than quite severe, NAC did appear to be more beneficial, um, as well as people who hadn't had OCD for a really, really long time. So that's when we did start to see a bit of a signal with NAC. But because our group was, was quite diverse in the different types of symptoms they had and the severity and the chronicity of the OCD, sometimes that significance <coughs> gets lost when we do our statistical tests in such a small group. So what we're trying to do at the moment, or what we are going to be doing, is running the study again, but on a much larger scale. So we're looking to recruit about 200 people with obsessive compulsive disorder, um, using a slightly different, different dosage regime with NAC, so going up to um, 4,000 milligrams. 
and a longer study as well. So looking to run run the study for six months. So see, trying to work out if maybe NAP does just work for 12 weeks or do we see it sort of having a, a carrying on effect thereafter. So trying to work that out as well with that longer um, period. Um, so like I said, it's we're looking to start recruitment sort of now. So if people are interested in this, I do have some flyers I'll leave on the tables at the back here um, with my contact details. You can get in touch with me and um, ask me if you've got any questions about that. Um, yeah, and we are based at the Melbourne Clinic in Richmond for that study. And that is all from me. Questions for Georgina at all? Yes. Are any side effects involved with increasing the NAP uh, So, if we increase it yeah. more, would there be more side effects? Yes. Or is there any side effects anyway? In general, what we see with NAC, because it is something, it's, it has a sulfur component to it, it, tends to be digestive stuff. Often we'll see this when people start taking it for the first few weeks and then it seems to settle. So, are you looking at things like um, bloating, cramping, reflux, a bit of sort of burning sensation. Generally not too severe and like I said it does seem to settle as your body gets used to it. That's sort of the main side effects we, we come across. And if looking at going higher, there's been studies that use up to 8,000 milligrams of NAT, even more, with no real significant side effects. So it does seem to be something that is generally pretty well tolerated. Yep. Is that just adults that study or yeah, that study? yeah. The the one that, that we finished last year was just an adult population, and we'll do the same again with this one. There's been a few um, studies, I think maybe two studies with paediatric populations with NAC, and um, that study they didn't didn't find much of an effect with NAC, from what I remember. Yep. Could you mention a little bit more about your white box scale, like what that involves and how you measure Yeah, things? so it's, I guess what we say is the gold standard in research studies for assessing OCD and it's split up into two halves, so it'll have five questions about um, the person's obsessive thoughts or the intrusive thoughts they're having and then five questions about more of the compulsive behaviours and basically you're looking at the amount of time they spend doing those things, the impact it has on the person, um, how it makes them feel, so how bad does the anxiety get, and do they have much, I guess, sway over those sort of behaviours, so looking at that sort of control aspect. Yep. Questions? No. All right, thank uh, you. One more? Yep. Just to say congratulations on <coughs> the scientific approach you've taken to the science myself. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you.